Good afternoon. This is Bruce Molitoris. I'm here with three distinguished physician scientists. First is Ben Humphreys from the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Second is Roy Prabir Roy Chadre from the University of Cincinnati. And the third is Chip Brocious from the University of Michigan. Uh, it's great to have you guys here, and I'd just like to ask you a little bit about the meeting and what your feelings are so far, and if there's been anything in particular that's been exciting and rewarding to you individually or to you think to the community. So Ben, you want to give us a little bit of input in those areas. The thing that really has struck me is that although we haven't had new therapies to treat a variety of kidney disease, particularly in my field, acute kidney injury, but also chronic kidney disease, I really feel like the uh, science that's being presented at this Kidney Week shows that we're on the verge of bringing new therapies. We have a convergence of new technologies, of basic research, of understanding mm -hmm. mechanisms uh, and cellular hierarchies that we really didn't understand before uh, on the basic side. And on the clinical side, we have all these new tools, biomarkers, redefining endpoints for clinical trials. And then we have pharmaceutical companies who, for the first time in a, in a while, have taken a very substantial interest in developing new therapies for our patients. And so that uh, kind of momentum is what I have sensed here at this meeting so far and I find uh, to be really exciting. Chip, you wanna? Yeah, oh, I couldn't, uh, couldn't disagree at all with what Ben said. I mean, this is a, a very exciting time and I think the meeting has really highlighted a lot of that sort of translational potential you're really indicating. Uh, you know, just the plenary session this morning, uh, two talks that really, I thought, set the stage for this in an incredible way. You know, uh, we're celebrating Steve Somlow's work over the past decade or more, but, uh, but really, you know, that's moved into an area where, you know, we are starting to really understand polycystic kidney disease in a very intricate molecular way, and that just by manipulating the number of cilia on proximal tubular cells, you might be able to really ameliorate polycystic kidney disease. And, and that seems like, it's still, we don't know how we're going to do that, but that seems like a really feasible goal to move forward. Uh, you don't have to spend 25 years to develop a new drug and a new approach, perhaps. And then Hal Dietz coming from a non-kidney area, but really focusing on, you know, a, a, a disease that probably I wouldn't have ever thought about being a curable disease, Marfan syndrome, you know, uh, and taking a different approach. Uh, systems, but very translational, doctor-driven approach, you know, to his patients, uh, coming up with a, a cheap treatment that probably essentially cures this disease in kids who have it, you know, angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, you know, who would have thought? And then he follows that with a whole new set of data on scleroderma and uh, that affects the kidneys, you know, coming from a group of patients who just have skin disease to show that uh, TGF-beta driven mechanisms, uh, if we interrupt them in the right way, could prevent all the kidney and other systemic manifestations perhaps of this, you know, untreatable or certainly uncurable d uh, disease that we've had to deal with for, for centuries. And so I think it's very exciting. Prabir, anything on the diagnostics? Uh, I know that's an area of your expertise. Yeah. <coughs> so I was going to take off a little bit from what both of you have sure. said, both diagnostic and, mm -hmm. and therapeutics. Uh, so one of the things that really struck me on this meeting that I thought was really exciting was this whole sort of combination of technology and innovation and entrepreneurship. And there were two things that I really think brought, uh, you know, brought home the message. And uh, so there was this great advances in research conference that, that I really thought combined all the stuff about innovation and entrepreneurship and sort of put out to particularly I hope the, the, the younger sort of fellows and younger faculty, how, how can you really take something that's, that's new and innovative and actually get it to a position where you're going to be able to help patients clinically, you know, potentially have a company. The other thing linked to that that I thought was really neat was the, the, the Innovators Forum or the Innovators Place. And I actually just walked through that and uh, there's some really neat, neat devices there. I mean, they're, they're little you know, there's a Doppler machine that looks like an egg. There's uh, little pins that go into a catheter that's coated with antibiotics. Uh, there's, there's, you know, there's a neat little bioengineered vessel that's out there. And, you know, to me, I, I just feel that nephrology 
particularly dialysis, is such a technology intensive field. And I just think that, you know, bringing entrepreneurship and innovation mm -hmm. in technology into this field, uh, I think that's something that can really, you know, jumpstart us moving ahead very quickly. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. It reminded me about the, there's, for the first time, I think, this meeting, there's an, a, a whole symposium dedicated to ultrasound technologies uh, right. for, largely directed at dialysis, but also at CKD, but, you know, just uh, whole new ways of uh, assessing uh, the things that we've been kind of not been able to assess too well over, over my career here in nephrology and now all of a sudden may have new tools. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think the potential challenge there, major challenge, is that we're dealing with the healthcare industry when advancing diagnostics that are going to cost money uh, is difficult because everyone's looking at it. It not only has to be safe, it has to work well and give you information, but it's got to be cost effective. It has to r reduce the overall cost to the government or to society before it's going to move forward. And I, and I think this is a challenge, and I'd like to hear your yeah, I mean, view on that. So, um, so uh, I'm going to put the question back to you in a way. Mm -hmm. and do, you, do you think that as we go towards a more bundled care system, that if we are innovative about the process within this bundle care system, that maybe some of the newer diagnostics that you spoke about, if they really work really well, could they potentially be, become really cost effective? And that'll maybe allow us to get rid of some of the other stuff that we do that isn't so cost effective. So uh, I don't know, I'm throwing it back to you. Well, I, I, Is that an answer? I, uh, it's an answer. <laughs> I, I, I think that one always has to look at the timeline behind cost effective. And if you are like a lot of American businesses right now and you have to see it within a one-year trajectory to be in your bottom line and it's a three-year outcome, it becomes then very difficult to get the funding to advance because they know that uh, organizations, whether that organization is a large dialysis operation or whether it's a hospital or a healthcare network, are going to be very um, challenged to invest in something that's for a couple of years going to cost them money until a long-term outcome comes out that actually saves them money. Um. Yeah, I was, <coughs> yeah I, well, I was gonna say that there was a session on biomarkers today and, and, and we've had great sessions on biomarkers going back five years even and I think initially there was great enthusiasm that we would find the kidney troponin that we always talk about that would, as you say, save us money and uh, diagnose patients and immediately affect outcomes. And we've w reached a, a much more nuanced view today. And that session this morning really drove that point home. We know these biomarkers are useful, but they're not just going to be one biomarker. And you've still got to be a smart doctor to interpret it and to know when to, to get it. It has to be fast, it has to be point of care, and, uh, and, and then you have to synthesize that information within the whole clinical picture. And, and so it may take more than a couple years, but on the other hand, I think great progress has been made. And we're now thinking about how biomarkers can be incorporated into clinical trials. And to talk about saving money, I think in AKI, uh, as we all know, there uh, is no FDA approved drug and many negative trials. But if we can diagnose it earlier with biomarkers, with a panel of biomarkers, we'll have more hope of affecting the course of disease and preventing people from requiring dialysis or going on to CKD and ESRD. And, and ultimately, that will save a lot of money. Oh, you bet. And, and you know, uh, the biomarkers that uh, we're looking at are going to be more complicated than troponin because the kidney is a lot more complicated than the heart. Sorry, cardiology, but you know, that's the way it is. And I don't think we're ever going to have a single biomarker that does all things. But, but I, I agree with you, the promise is, is great. And I think they're, you know, we're not quite there yet, but for diabetic kidney disease, the most common cause of chronic kidney disease, I think we're pretty close to, prog you know, pretty good prognostic biomarkers that will really target those patients that have the highest chance of progressing rapidly and that's who we're going to want to target our studies and 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 really our therapies uh, for and so and, I, and just to second your point i mean that is the most cost effective approach long term yes. it doesn't doesn't yes. vitiate what uh, bruce was saying about how do you talk organizations into doing the right thing but still you know that's you know, if we save 
20% of people from going to dialysis, boy, the, I think the government would be quite happy. <laughs> I, was, uh, I, I was just going to go back to, to, to Bruce's initial comment and, and just say that one of the things that the ASN has, I think, really championed over the last year and a half, and Bruce, you and Ron Falk have been really involved in it, has been the Kidney Health Initiative, right, and, right. and uh, you know, that's really a public-private partnership between ASN and the FDA, and the goal is really right. to do exactly what we've all been talking about, to try and facilitate the passage of drugs, devices, uh, uh, biologics uh, in, into the kidney space. So, so maybe a lot of what we've said hopefully can coalesce uh, into, into that platform, really, which is what the KHI uh, is. I'm going to take you back to your bar biomarkers comment where you said w we actually have to think and I think <laughs> when people started, the unrealistic expectation was we wouldn't have to think. We would have a pregnancy test for AKI, right? And you either had it or you didn't, and so we'll move forward. And, but I, I think there's excitement to that because a nephrologist is a thinking physician. And I think we can excite the younger generations to really understand what's going on, how to use these biomarkers, how to better patient care, and how to be you know, smarter than the next person over when it comes to taking care of that patient uh, in the hospital to have a meaningful outcome. And I'm hoping that we can sell this not in a, another complex renal situation, but really, you know, here's how we put it together. Here are the thought processes. No, you don't want to get an FE, you know, a fractional excretion of sodium in this patient because it's not going to help you, but it will help you in this patient uh, once you weigh all the data together. And, and I think we can interest people uh, in, you know, that kind of spectrum and challenge. Well, I think, you know, certainly one of the biggest reasons I went into nephrology is because of all the intellectual challenge and the complexity of the organ and the complexity of the diseases and all the thinking that we need to do to diagnose and treat our patients. And, uh, and I agree that, you know, how fascinating would it be to be in the ER and have, you know, be looking at a sediment and see some white cells uh, and then have an interstitial uh, inflammation biomarker that right. one could get right. or to see some red cells and maybe they're dysmorphic and to have a podocyte damage right. biomarker uh, and that can help tune the way you think and, and hone your differential which is what we do all the time but it really expands and adds a really um, a fascinating new dimension to the way we might diagnose and care for our patients. And then to have a really good treatment. <laughs> Once you have a good diagnosis, well, have a really good treatment. I, I yeah. think we're all stuck, though, with until you can diagnose it effectively, right. narrow the, the heterogeneity of your population, right. Right. then you can start working on specific therapies. Right. Uh, we spent a long time yesterday talking about molecular diagnostics in, in the you know, approach to patient-specific uh, therapies. But I think the biomarkers... Uh, are another thing that are really going to help us narrow what we're treating uh, so that we can develop then effective therapies. Yeah. Um, and I saw some great examples of new drugs in the pipeline through zebrafish AKI screens or small molecule high throughput screens on cellular based assays. I think we're going to have a myriad of drugs to choose from. The real challenge for us will be defining our patient populations and uh, and designing trials that right. won't be destined to fail because we di we enroll patients too late enroll the wrong patients, or we have yeah. a heterogeneous population. Right. right. Okay. Any other exciting things? Um, I, I, I was going to, and so this is far, far away from biomarkers and, and molecular biology, but th there's a really neat, uh, I think it's going to be actually this afternoon, so it hasn't happened yet. Uh, uh, oral presentation session which is titled uh, Quality in the New mm -hmm. Dialysis Unit. And, and the reason that I think that's interesting, I, exciting is, and, and I may be biased here, is that I think it, this session begins to explore the idea that we should be doing a lot more in the dialysis unit than just washing out people's blood. So I, I think it begin, the session is getting towards that place where maybe we should be using this relatively high-tech environment to look after our patients' foot ulcers and hearts and psychosocial issues and, uh, 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 you know, infections and uh, education and, 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 you know, I'm not sure which, what direction the ESCOs and all will go in, but, you know, they, if it, perhaps 
with the ESCOs, we could go in this direction, that the dialysis unit or the facility is really a place where we can give really good quality care, which includes primary care to some extent. A lot of the things that I've spoken about are primary care type issues. Well, maybe that's the way with, that we will truly be able to make uh, an impact on the quality of life of our patients. And yeah, no, I think it's very important. I think one thing you mentioned is, is an ulcer. And, and we think of an ulcer as a very isolated spot on the patient that needs therapy. But we don't think about the inflammatory, systemic inflammatory processes that that initiates through the whole body in a, in a disease process that is already in a high inflammatory state. And the additional burden and muscle wasting and uh, the way the patient feels, to us it's a, just a little ulcer. To them, it's a systemic manifestation and, and a worsening of their disease process. And, and I would applaud you. I do think we will have to increase quality. Uh, it's one of the, the you know, the um, things I mentioned in my presentation of going from ordinary right. to extraordinary Absolutely. care. I think that has to be our goal. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 you know, and, and that's really good. I mean, and, the, uh, and we have the ability in a way, perhaps more than other specialties, to do the extraordinary because our patients come in three times a week mm -hmm. for four hours in a, in, a rel in, a, in a very relatively high tech sort of medical environment. Clearly, we have to put in many more resources, whether it's social workers or nurses or, or others, but it's just, I mean, I think your leap from ordinary to extraordinary, maybe we have a mechanism to do that in the dialysis unit. And we were just hearing from the NIH, interestingly, about uh, a, s a small survey they did uh, with medical students uh, that they actually, the, f the early medical students really like coming to the dialysis unit because there they s actually see continuity of care in a way that they don't usually. So think about what a great training vehicle the, the quality in would be for, uh, for our students, residents, and, and fellows, which it already I, I never is. thought I'd hear NIH pushing that's, for dialysis. That's right, that's right, that's right, <laughs> I was, that's yay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, I'll bring up one thing this morning from the second speaker, from Hal Dietz's presentation, yeah. and he was a little concerned that it wasn't uh, focused on the kidney or nephrology, but it was such a, an exciting um, presentation. And to me, an AKI, and I'm sure Ben picked it up, was the dendritic cell is n known to play a very large role, an expanding role in the kidney in inflammation and fibrosis uh, and, and the pathway that he outlined uh, with dendritic cells and cytokines and TGF beta. And, it, you know, I want to get a copy of that slide because I think that is just, just applicable to the kidney, both in acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease with the fibrotic process that's ongoing. And, and uh, Ben, your comment? Well, it's a wonderful example of how basic inquiry and a sort of physician scientist oriented mind can take a discovery which at the time as great as it was fibrillin you know must have been and he said it was disappointing because how, how can I create a drug against fibrillin but you know curiosity and persistence and hard work uh, led to these incredible innovations in uh, fields which he and we never would have predicted. I mean, systemic sclerosis, uh, uh, apparently autoimmune disease, you would never link that with Marfan syndrome, and yet they share a common pathophysiology. And exactly uh, as you point out, Bruce, I think dendritic cells, macrophages are real um, central players in chronic kidney disease uh, and in, in acute kidney injury. And, um, and we're beginning to have drugs that target them. Um, and so, so, but I think for me, the real lesson was we've, you know, we've got to keep uh, we've got to keep our enthusiasm for research, and we've got to attract uh, the next generation, and we've got to portray how satisfying uh, it is. And we've talked about the workforce issues, and you touched on that in your presidential address, and I think right. we've got big problems to tackle, but I think we've got big solutions that are coming soon, too. Yeah, can I follow yes. up on that for just a sec? Because, yeah, there was one other point that, that Ben alluded to, but I just want to underline about that talk and that presentation. So Hal Dietz is a, you know, is a clinician. He has his, follows his patients. He's an MD uh, trained uh, great scientist. But the reason that he th thought that it wasn't just a structural deficit in folks with Marfan syndrome was because of the patients that he saw every day in clinic. So, you know, what what better advertisement for the need for physician scientists who are actually seeing patients and 
can learn from their patients about the basic mechanisms of disease if you're smart enough and observant enough to do so. And so, you know. And, and uh, you know, from our NIH uh, meeting we had just prior to this, the NIH DK in particular has been very committed to the physician scientists, to developing grant opportunities and funding for physician scientists. I know we have an O'Brien chip uh, at Michigan, you have an O'Brien, and um, we're able to bring in students every summer. Uh, there are enhanced and expanded uh, plans and, and programs to allow medical students to do a year of research if they would like to um, at the NIH expense or at the ASN's expense. Uh, we also offer programs for that. And it's really an opportunity to develop the physician scientists. And, and you know, I, I uh, think that nephrology is an area where tremendous progress can and will be made. Uh, and as opposed to several other disciplines, we have a brighter future at making progress because we're a little bit behind the curve. Uh, and so I think it's going to be just a, a tremendous time in, in translating and now treating our patients uh, in the future. Well, and I think that bringing up this new generation of um, students into our field is one of the many important things that the Kidney Health Initiative is going to play a right. huge role in doing. And, you know, I noticed this afternoon there's a, a social media session, and this is another kind of fun thing that has crept into our field happily. We've got the ASN Twitter feed. Twitter feed. We have Neff Madness in in March. The Renal Fellow Network blog, and uh, many more ways to reach that younger generation of of uh, potential right. physician scientists. Right. And I think it's fun to see the different ways that that's taking shape. And, uh, and the other thing that's in this meeting uh, as well, which I link to that sort of is quite neat, is that th there are some sessions which are focusing on education and on teaching. And I think that's really important. I mean, we can be just, you know, it's, we need to be, I think, more innovative, uh, more cooler perhaps uh, role playing for example and Kenar Javeri you know has done some great stuff uh, in that uh, make one fellow a B lymphocyte and another fellow a T lymphocyte <laughs> and, and just you know try and try and uh, say what the interaction between them would be so I, I think innovation in, 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 in teaching is, is, is also very important and there are a number of sessions actually here that uh, in this meeting right. that focus right. on that. You know that we have been slow to get those started but I think they have been oversubscribed when we've offered them and each year we're offering more and more and we're becoming more creative and y you know I think partly the work um, for shortage begins in the medical schools and uh, I think we have to try and improve our educational process uh, to maximize the interest. So just to add to that I just talked to one of my old teachers today uh, who has uh, he's got a new app for students and residents on the, on the iPhone that's just been just being rolled out, Bob Brown at the uh, at the BI. I so, heard about it. Bob, yeah, Bob was my yeah, was my yeah, attending yeah, as well. Yeah, I yeah, trained under him. That's, uh, that's I heard that as well yesterday. Yeah. So you know, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I have no uh, connection with this. I have no conflicts. <laughs> I just, he just showed it to me on his iPhone. I thought it was it's, great. So. I, I have to comment to that because you know, Bob. At least when when I maybe trained after you was not. I mean, he was just a, a patient and a physician's physician. I, I would never have thought that he would have been the person to go out and, and get the app. That's huge. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to thank all of you for taking the time to come in and give your opinions on the meeting. Um, I think we can hopefully educate uh, people who are at the meeting and people who didn't have the time to come to the meeting and will certainly want to come next year. Uh, it's great to see this enthusiasm. Uh, for the future, and I thank all of you for your input. Well, thank you, Bruce. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations. And congratulations. Great, great meeting. Yeah.